The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guest or host are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced Orthomolecular Research Incorporated. Hello and welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Herkel. This show is all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. We are going to feature some very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to lead their best lives naturally. And welcome back to Supplementing Health. As always, Dr. Paul Herkel here as your host. Today is one of the topics that is probably the one that I'm most excited about because it's a nutrient that I've been on record saying that it's my favorite nutrient. And as you know, it's magnesium. In my practice, I have, I believe it's five or six different types of magnesium. Not different brands, different products, but actually different forms of magnesium. And with such a simple mineral that probably everybody is familiar with, I think it really pays and it's going to be valuable for us to really understand about how do we get the most out of this mineral. It's one that you've probably tried, maybe you're on currently, maybe you're considering taking. So this topic, which is going to be broken down into two episodes because I just won't have time to do justice and get into the detail about how this powerful mineral is so incredibly important to almost every single aspect of our health. And I really do mean that. And to really understand that, we're going to understand how it works in the body and what it does. And I'm a big believer in... When you understand biology, when you understand physiology, when you understand what magnesium does in the body, it all kind of falls into place after that, knowing how it's applied. So if you understand the pathophysiology and the biochemistry, it just leads into the expression of disease and expression of symptoms. So that's where we're going to start with magnesium today. Today's a solo episode, and this is one I'm happily to embark on because this is an area that I spent a lot of time in and understanding. So it definitely is something that hopefully everybody will get a lot out of. So let's jump right in. So a good way to break down magnesium is first understanding, yes, it's a mineral. Uh, and this may be a bit of a blast from the past for some people and get bring them back to their high school biochemistry even and maybe, you know, first year undergrad or college biochem classes, but understanding magnesium is a mineral and it's from the left side of the periodic table. And those minerals have certain properties and similar to calcium and potassium. And those minerals in general are alkalining minerals. They have an alkaline property to them. And the function that they have in the body is to regulate acid-base balance. We'll talk about that as it applies to physiology, but it's just good to understand, you know, where it's coming from. There are four main areas in the body that magnesium really plays a key role. So the first one we're going to focus on is energy production. So again, this is again, it goes, brings back to biochem. I remember learning this very vividly sitting in, I believe it was like uh, Mr. Kepler's uh, grade 10 science class, but talking about how energy and ATP, which is the currency of energy in our bodies, how it is made. And magnesium is a central molecule, a central mineral in that ATP molecule. So think about it this way. You need magnesium for every little unit of energy that you make, for every molecule of ATP. And if you happen to be deficient in magnesium, which we're going to talk a lot about very shortly you can clearly see how you're going to 
not be able to make as much of your ATP. So just breaking it down in that very sense, ATP powers every single function in the body almost. And you can't survive without that energy. And basically you're the product of your ATP stores. So magnesium is really important for both aerobic respiration, which is using oxygen. So if we're just sitting and you're listening to this podcast, maybe driving somewhere, you're using aerobic respiration. So oxygen is in ample supply. Uh, and that uses mitochondria. And these little organelles, these little power plants inside of our cell will take glucose, so they'll take sugar, and they'll take oxygen, and through a series of reactions and a lot of cofactors, and cofactors is where magnesium comes in. These are basically little lock and keys, little steps that have to go along on each process to allow an enzyme to go from step A to step B to step C. So magnesium plays a key role in this process, and ultimately, the culmination of this process is to produce eight energy. So magnesium and energy production is huge. The second probably best known way that magnesium is used in the body is for muscle function. So just to get everyone on the same page here, magnesium in the terms of muscle function falls into a class of minerals called electrolytes. And so we know things like calcium and sodium and potassium anybody that's ever got a muscle cramp if they've been out in the sun too long maybe playing beach volleyball like i did was very common for seeing guys killed over holding their hamstrings and that has a lot to do with their electrolyte balance but just on a day-to-day function for any muscle to contract you are going to have to have calcium which is usually outside the cell rush into the cell Uh, and which is going to cause the contraction in the muscle cell, and you're going to then have it pump back out. Inside the cell is where magnesium hangs out, along with potassium, where calcium and sodium hang hang out outside the cell. And basically, if you're going to have enough of your magnesium stores, it basically balances the amount of calcium that rushes in and then gets pumped back out. So if you're deficient in magnesium, calcium is just going to hang out inside the cell longer because one of the key principles and one of the key facts that we now know about calcium and magnesium is that that there's there's a relationship between the two minerals. And typically you can summarize that as the two minerals have opposing functions. So calcium is a bit more of a contractor, so C, calcium for contraction, and magnesium is for relaxation. So more magnesium usually means more relaxed musculature, where extra calcium is going to be more contraction. So remember I mentioned calcium contracts the muscle as it rushes in the cell, magnesium then relaxes it. So in this particular case, bringing it back to maybe symptoms that you might feel, a common symptom of magnesium deficiency and imbalance is that you have muscle cramps, muscle contraction, tight muscles. In my practice, I see a lot of chronic pain patients. You're going to see a lot of tense necks, tense uh, trapezius muscles, which connect, which are upper back muscles connecting our, up into our necks uh, and muscles throughout the body that are very, very tight. Or maybe if you're going to use an internal example inside of our, inside of our vasculature, our blood vessels, if you have blood vessels that are contracted too much, so there's too much calcification or calcium buildup, not only do the blood vessels get hard, but also they're not able to relax to decrease blood pressure. So magnesium, as we'll see in a second, or we'll hear, magnesium is a really nice uh, mineral that decreases blood pressure because it relaxes blood vessels. So muscle function and uh, by, uh, I guess, uh, by extension, the blood flow as well, magnesium plays a key role there. Two other key roles, I've, I touched on one of them already. I don't know if you knew this, but magnesium is involved directly or indirectly in over 220 different biochemical processes. Now, this may not mean much, but compared to other minerals and other nutrients where they have a couple biochemical processes, magnesium by far and away eclipses that. And so one of these roles, many of these roles of magnesium is as a cofactor. And I mentioned that in the energy production, but basically magnesium is the substance or the, sorry, the mineral that allows, for example, a protein or a receptor, which is the, the way that the body communicates with other parts of our organs and our cells 
in our body, magnesium is required for that receptor to receive that signal, to receive that message. So a particular one that is very important, again, relating it back to something that people are experiencing from a health perspective is the insulin receptor. So anytime you take a bite of any food, especially very sugary food, that sugar, that glucose is absorbed in your bloodstream and then insulin is secreted to suck that glucose back into your cells. That's where glucose is needed for energy production. Magnesium is required for insulin to properly function as well as to for insulin to be properly produced in the pancreas. So it's incredibly important for blood sugar production, uh, regulation, and control. And then finally, nerve signaling. And this goes a little bit back to the muscle function, but magnesium as an electrolyte, a key signaling mineral, it is important for the signaling of our nerve, uh, of our nerve signals, our nerve transmissions. So the production of neurochemicals such as neurotransmitters, magnesium is very important. So these are the four areas, energy production, muscle function, cofactors, 320 different processes, and nerve signaling. So you can really see, just if you understood that, you can really see how magnesium plays a key role in a lot of really important areas that it comes to our health. Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic pain, these are like the three main areas that people are going to see their doctors for. This is the, the, these are three of the main causes of not just mortality, but also morbidity, which is basically feeling crummy and crappy all the time. So magnesium is invaluable for this. And so the research actually shows that there's research on magnesium showing that it can decrease blood pressure three to four millimeters of mercury uh, in the systolic, which is the, the bigger number, and then two to three millimeters of mercury in the diastolic, which is the, the second number if you were to take your blood pressure. And that may seem small, but actually is pretty substantial if you look at it. Over time, uh, you know, cardiovascular medications will decrease at five, maybe maximum 10, uh, and blood and magnesium is just a little bit, uh, a little bit right under that, but uh, also very effective. And then also in blood sugar, we talked about diabetes. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge issue and that promotes other health issues like cardiovascular disease, cancer risk, uh, cognitive decline is a massive one. Uh, brain is, and nerves are, are, we already talked about, but that's incredibly important as his role in magnesium. So uh, the nerve transmission and the production of our nerve signaling molecules, neurotransmitters. And then finally, magnesium, I use a lot of it in, in practice to regulate inflammation, to decrease inflammation. There's research showing that a marker of inflammation called C-reactive protein can be decreased after supplementing with magnesium. Uh, conditions such as brain injuries, which are inflammation is a hallmark, or even asthma, those people have been shown to have lower levels of magnesium. 60% reduction in magnesium after a concussion. Uh, in asthma, the dilation of not just blood vessels and cardiovascular disease, but actually our air tubes in our lungs, our, our bronchii, they are actually can vasodilate them after supplement with magnesium. So there's the applications are really, really wide reaching. Just to summarize here, there's research in magnesium supplementation and depression, fibromyalgia, Headaches and migraines are huge. Again, that has a lot to do with blood flow. It has to do with nerves. So those two areas we talked at length about the influence of magnesium. Heart palpitations and irregular heartbeats. Osteoporosis. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. We think of calcium for and, and really overlook magnesium when it comes to osteoporosis, but it is very important for bone health. Calcium, think of calcium kind of as that, that bricks of, uh, if we're going to use a house analogy, and magnesium is a bit of kind of a scaffolding. It gives a little bit more of flexibility and tensile strength to that calcium uh, matrix, basically, and, and magnesium is a really important part of that matrix. In fact, 50 to 60% of your magnesium is stored in your bones. So... What you'll notice with magnesium supplementation is that most people will, will 
especially if they're really deficient, they'll notice an improvement in their like muscle spasm. They'll notice their headaches are improved. And this has to do with their blood vessels, usually uh, spasticity and blood flow. Uh, that happens pretty quickly after supplementing with magnesium, I would say usually within a couple days to a week. And then people either stop supplementing with magnesium, but really you haven't corrected a deficiency. And we'll talk a lot about deficiency because that's really important. But you just supplementing short term doesn't rebuild your bone levels. That's where magnesium is stored. So it takes, I've seen some literature showing, it takes sometimes up to six months to properly increase the levels in your bone. Because if you're deficient, the body will use what it needs immediately in the muscles and tissues. And then once things are okay there, they'll start refilling your gas tank. And your magnesium gas tank is in your bones. Extremely important for people with osteoporosis. Uh, one other thing to point out about the connection between bones and magnesium is that after calcium, vitamin D is probably the most commonly thought of vitamin or nutrient when it comes to bone health. But magnesium plays an incredibly valuable role when it comes to vitamin D. Because what it does is that it helps vitamin D become active. And it's very, um, it's very helpful indirectly at supporting bone health. So that is, that is one way that often, again, overlooked, but magnesium plays a key role. So it's when you get magnesium created inside of your cells, if you're exposed to the sun, or if you supplement, you supplement with a form of vitamin D called vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol, but then magnesium is required for it to be activated into its 25 hydroxy and then finally 125 hydroxy form. That's the active form. And these are done in the liver and the kidney and magnesium is so important in, its, in this activation. So that is a hugely, hugely valuable and often overlooked reason why magnesium is important for bone health. And vitamin D, by the way, is important for immune health. It's important for brain function. We're probably going to have an episode on vitamin D, which will detail all the reasons why it's so important and why really calling it a vitamin is actually not doing it full justice because it really is a, is really is a hormone in terms of how important it is for signaling. There are many other conditions that would benefit from supplementing with magnesium. These are just a couple that I mentioned and some of the most common ones. Uh, PMS is one that I just thought of off the top of my head that is very common. A lot of listeners that are female may be experiencing that. And that has to do with all the processes we talked about. Muscle cramps, so your uterine cramps, those painful periods, pain before your period. Mood, remember we looked at magnesium for depression. So mood and neurotransmission. So that's the other big aspect of PMS. So magnesium really is helpful for almost every single a health condition. So that's some of the reasons why it's working in the body. That's some of the research behind it, some of the health applications. Let's talk about absorption because that's the first place that we're, we're looking at uh, when we're we getting it into our bodies. Magnesium is absorbed primarily in the small intestine and maybe... 50% of it's absorbed. So if you're taking a magnesium supplement and it has 100 milligrams in it, you're probably only getting about 50 milligrams at best. That's something important to consider. That's actually a very common factor in every single one of your supplements. Like vitamin C, for example, maybe 20, 30% of it is absorbed. And those numbers are actually, you know, similar or in some cases lower in foods. And the reason being is because in foods, you have things like fiber, you have things like fats and proteins that compete for absorption. So magnesium in general is best absorbed on an empty stomach. The reason being is that minerals require stomach acid to properly take them out of their food matrix. So all the different molecules around it. So basically cut them out, cleave them out. Uh, and or a supplement, whether it's a food or a supplement. So HCL, hydrochloric acid, is very important. It's so important that, and this relates to the deficiency side of things, that many acid blocker, acid blocking medications like proton pump inhibitors, which are some of the worst 
offenders when it comes to creating magnesium deficiency in the body. They had come with a warning saying, be careful, they can cause serious magnesium deficiencies. And some of them actually have magnesium supplemented and combined with those with acid blocking medications. Not that they're really getting any benefit from it. So you need stomach acid first and foremost to absorb magnesium. There also is different ways the, after it's, it's actually cut apart and, uh, and ready to be actually absorbed. So that's in the upper digestive system. Now, once it gets to the small intestine, there's a couple ways that things happen. So normally there's just kind of like a passive diffusion which is a common way that small molecules like minerals get absorbed. So this is just kind of like it just gets absorbed through the single layer of our intestinal wall. Uh, and then there's something called um, amino acid absorption. And basically there is a particular pathway in the body that takes magnesium and an amino acid that is bound to and absorbs it. And so this actually is a huge innovation and a, and a huge uh, uh, therapeutic pathway that we can use to actually increase the absorption of magnesium. A small amount of it gets absorbed this way. Most of it gets absorbed through the kind of passive, uh, the passive route. But you can actually use combinations of magnesium and amino acid like magnesium bisglycinate or magnesium malate. Glycine or glycinate when it's called glycinate when it's combined with something else are amino acids. So they're actually actively absorbed through this pathway. So those are those are the two ways that magnesium gets absorbed. Uh, and it, uh, it the amino acid form or the amino acid pathway gives us an option to really be um, extra therapeutic. We'll talk about that in the in part two of, of the magnesium episodes here. So I mentioned a little bit about deficiency. So we talked about absorption. It's important to know about absorption before we talk about deficiency because as I mentioned, many things that block absorption can cause magnesium deficiency. So we talked about medications. So they're a very common reason that magnesium is so deficient in our society. Just a couple comments about deficiency of magnesium in general. When a governmental organization called NHANES, it's a really, it was a really, really big study then a couple of years ago, looked at nutrients that were being consumed. They basically looked at nutrients uh, by the general population that were achieving through their diet the recommended amounts. And they found that only 50% of people were getting the bare minimum of magnesium. Let that sink in for a second. That means if you're in a room of 10 people, five of those people are getting suboptimal levels of magnesium and they've been getting that their whole lives or at different parts in their lives. So now the question of who's magnesium deficient is very easy to answer and the answer is almost everybody because we simply aren't getting it in our diets. Combine that with there's many things vying for the actually blocking of the absorption of magnesium. So I mentioned medications. So certain cardiovascular medications decrease the absorption of magnesium. So diuretics are, are a common one. First line for hypertension. ACE inhibitors can cause magnesium depletion, which is another uh, cardiovascular high blood pressure medication. The same thing that magnesium is so effective for the medications that are given for those things are causing the deficiency in magnesium. That, 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 that boggles my mind when you actually think about it. I mentioned proton pump inhibitors. Any medication that will block stomach acid, something as simple as uh, antacids, so some, you know, Rolaids, Tums, stuff that you're popping over the counter will block the absorption of your minerals. And it's not just magnesium, it's all your minerals. It's going to be your iron, it's going to be your potassium, it's going to be your selenium, zinc, all the trace minerals. So the medications depleting things are, are a huge issue. And the second reason that, that I'm the second reason that people are so deficient is that it's no magnesium is no longer present in our food supply like it was in the past. And this is what scientists uh, are are theorizing because magnesium intakes are so low as i already mentioned and there's many cases that 
so many common health concerns are characterized by magnesium deficiency, the farming practices, especially the big commercial agro business, they're focused on high yields. And when you understand magnesium, its main role in fertilizer and in agriculture is to strengthen the plant. I used to work at a uh, at a, a tree farm that had a retail outlet, uh, a nursery, and we talked about the fertilizer and the magnesium number. There's three numbers. The magnesium is kind of the strengthener of the of the plant. Magnesium is primarily found in plants. It's not found in animal products. So unlike iron, which is found in animal products, magnesium is found all in greens and plants. It is actually the central mineral in chlorophyll. So that green pigment that gives plants its green color and that you can actually buy as a supplement is really rich in magnesium because the central mineral in, in each chlorophyll molecule is magnesium, where in the plant world, iron is that central molecule in hemoglobin, which is kind of analogous to chlorophyll. So you can see that plants, if they're not getting magnesium from the soil, they're going to be deficient themselves. And then when we're eating it, we're not getting the same amount of magnesium that we should be getting. Uh, there's a number of other reasons why magnesium is deficient. Uh, we mentioned diet. So if you're eating poorly, if you're not eating plants, so think of all the, the, the people that are just eating processed foods, uh, think of all the people that are just eating um, meats and 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 more uh, carbs. They're going to be missing out on those uh, magnesium-rich plants. There's less magnesium in water. A big source of magnesium actually is in water. And when you add in fluoride and you add in filtering, magnesium often gets filtered out. And so that is traditionally, my family hails from Central Europe and mineral springs were a huge source of minerals and in general, calcium and magnesium. And so I'm not advocating for using mineral waters because they can often be high in other things we don't want them to be like calcium, but some mineral waters are very high in magnesium. And those are the ones that actually have been associated with the most health benefits. And they're throughout the world, actually. Um, some from Australia, New Zealand, um, from Central Europe. And they, those, those particular spas, those particular springs were always revered for being very, very healing, and they happen to have lots of magnesium in it as well. Uh, so these are all these factors are conspiring to decrease the amount of magnesium that we have in our bodies, that we have in our diets. So when a lot of people ask, should I be supplementing with magnesium? And then the, the kind of the Puritans will say, well, you know what? I get everything through foods. I said, you know what? In an ideal world, absolutely. I think this is the best way to do it. But the reality is, even eating organic, unless you're growing all of your own foods and you're fertilizing your soil, I think most people that are living in our kind of urbanized world are going to be buying things from more larger scale, commercially grown produce. You're not still not getting the amount of magnesiums that you need. Couple that with what if you have chronic pain, tight muscles from studying all the time, something like fibromyalgia. Now you need extra levels of magnesium, much higher levels. You might have been on a medication for a long time for a different reason that could have depleted your magnesium. And now you have the need for extra. So I'm a big believer that 99% of people need to supplement magnesium to get their levels up. And then maybe you can maintain with diet but magnesium is so essential that I think it's one of those things that is an absolute must on a regular and part of your regular supplemental regime. There are foods that are high in magnesium. And so, you know, some of them are a key part of, uh, you know, my family's staple diet. Uh, pumpkin seeds are one of my favorites. Again, kind of per serving size rather than just per amount. But pumpkin seeds, uh, black eyed peas, sunflower seeds, tempeh. Uh, certain cereals do have magnesium. Almonds have magnesium. Uh, Swiss chard, spinach, flax seeds. But if you're looking for some of the highest levels, uh, pumpkin seeds are one of my favorites. From a serving perspective, they're going to have the highest amount of magnesium in it. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, I want to end off this 
episode part one, just talking about some of the symptoms you might be experiencing if you have low magnesium. So we we're talking about some of the reasons why you're deficient in magnesium. What are the effects of magnesium deficiency in the body? This is obviously a, you know, where the rubber meets the road. And so you've probably heard of some of these before, and I've mentioned them throughout the, sh- the, the episode so far, but just to kind of reiterate some of the common ones. Anytime anybody has a headache, anytime they have, they have tight muscles, especially neck muscles, back muscles, uh, spasms, restless legs, that's a big sign that magnesium is probably suboptimal. It could be other things. I'm not saying it's just magnesium, but magnesium probably is part of the picture. Uh, things like mood, anxiety, PMS, depression, magnesium can be deficient there as well. Uh, any sort of heart abnormalities, so like uh, irregular heartbeats. So potassium and magnesium are incredibly important for regulating heartbeats. We're going to talk about that and magnesium supplementation in part two uh, of these uh, of this episode of the series on magnesium. Uh, any sort of, I mentioned cramps already, <laughs> any sort of... Um, cramps after sports, potassium, magnesium are really important. Any sort of uh, cramps of the blood vessels, uh, vasculature. So think of things like poor circulation, blood flow to the legs and feet. Uh, You know, Raynaud's is something that comes to mind. And uh, hypertension that I talked about comes to mind. Any sort of artery disease, any sort of diabetes is really, really something that I think of magnesium deficiency. So those are a lot of a lot of factors that can can really point you to magnesium is very, very deficient. Um, I'll leave you with this little interesting tidbit. For every molecule of sugar that you consume, it takes 54 molecules of magnesium in your body to process it. So if you're consuming a ton of sugar, then you are massively increasing the need for your magnesium. And not to mention, when you increase sugar, you're going to increase the amount of dehydration, urination, out goes the magnesium, other factors. So magnesium is incredibly important. It's central to almost all of our health systems. So hopefully now we're all on the same page of that. Most of us are deficient. Almost every single health condition could benefit from using magnesium. In part two of this this series on magnesium, we're going to dive into how to get the most out of supplementing with magnesium, some of the pitfalls that people look at, what are the forms that are going to be most specific to the conditions that you are concerned about, and how do you get the most out of your supplements. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation about magnesium in the next show. Thank you for listening today. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcasts. Do you have a topic that you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca. We hope you tune in again next week to learn more about supplementing your health.